Yu-Gi-Oh! has been around for over a decade and has released a ton of cards throughout the years. Some of these cards are great, some not so much, and some are right in between. So let's go on an adventure to the unknown side of Yu-Gi-Oh! and find some of the more unique cards in its history. Today's episode, we're going to be going over gods and divine beasts. And starting off today's episode is the Dark Lord monsters. Although the greater archetype story has been covered before in another episode of the series, it's worth noting the inspirations for each of the members, as almost all of the Dark Lord monsters are based off of Judeo-Christian theology. All of the Dark Lord monsters are dark fairy type monsters which coincide with the themes of the Fallen Angels. And although several of the members in the archetype have made appearances in the shows with duelists like Serenity Wheeler, Rebecca Hawkins, and Fonda Fontaine, the full archetype had one true owner, Midori Hibiki who was only seen in the Yugo GX manga. The archetype focuses on first sending the Dark Lord monsters to the graveyard, and then special summoning them once more from the grave, which also works well with the themes of the deck. But now onto the members of the archetype, starting with Dark Lord Amdusk, which is a level 6 monster with 1800 attack and 2800 defense. Amdusk can discard itself and a Dark Lord to add back a Dark Lord monster to your hand, as well as pay 1000 life points to use a Dark Lord spell or trap from your graveyard, then shuffle it back into the deck. Amdusk is based off of Amdesius, which is a commander of the legions of the demons who is typically depicted as a human with claws, the head of a unicorn, and a trumpet to symbolize his command over the legions. Next is Dark Lord Asmodeus, a more well-known member of the archetype as Asmodeus was one of the original Dark Lord monsters. Asmodeus has to be normal summoned, as well as once per turn you can send a fairy type monster from your deck to the graveyard. Asmodeus's goal is to be destroyed, as once he is, he can summon two tokens. One can't be destroyed by battle, and the other can't be destroyed by card effects. His inspiration shares the same name as the monster card, and even a similar effect. Asmodeus is the king of both daemons and demons, which is translated through the two tokens that he summons. Dark Lord Desire is one of the higher level Dark Lord monsters, sitting at level 10. This 3000 tech monster can also be tribute summoned by using one fairy monster, which is rather unique as a summoning condition for older Yu-Gi-Oh. Additionally, once per turn, you can allow Desire to lose 1000 attack to send one targeted monster opponent controls to the graveyard. Desire's is based off Mammon, or Greed. Dark Lord Mari is one of the more iconic cards of the archetype, as it was known as Mari the Fallen One before it was eroded so it would fit into the archetype. Due to this, it's actually the only non-fairy monster in the archetype. For some reason, Konami wanted to keep the original name of Mari. Mari is a reference to the Virgin Mary. Although the naming isn't the same, the other translations for the card match up with the biblical name of Maria. Surprisingly, Lucifer the Fallen Angel has two references within the Dark Lord archetype. There's the more obvious Dark Lord Morningstar, which is the boss monster of the archetype, as well as Dark Lord Nurse Rafikiel. Although Dark Lord Morningstar is the more direct reference, Rafikiel was the original. She came out a whole year before the very first member of the archetype, Dark Lord Zerato, would be released. To further this, Rafikiel is a romanization of the name Lucifer written backwards. Although Rafikiel's effect isn't entirely unique, as it shares the same effect as Bad Reaction to Samochi, it's still one of the few cards that changes a critical aspect of the game, that being causing any life point gain to do damage instead. This unique effect has been utilized in Gimme OTK decks that utilize mass life point gain cards like Gift Card. Dark Lord Nastin is arguably the most intimidating looking of the Dark Lord monsters. Although his beast-like appearance isn't indicative of what biblical figure he's meant to represent, his wings are the giveaway. See, Nastin is based off of Mastema which was the Angel of Disaster, the father of evil who became corrupted and convinced God to condemn all demons. See, rather than the card itself, how this is referenced is in the card art of the cards Forbidden Droplet, when Nastin is converted into a demon, or in the case of Dark Lord, Dark Lord Contract, where Nastin goes to the gates of heaven to meet with God and the sanctified Dark Lord, where Nastin meets with God to try to convince him to condemn the demons. The last notable Dark Lord monster is Dark Lord Superbia, which is a level 9 monster with 2900 attack and 2400 defense. It has the simple effect that when it's special summoned from the graveyard, you can special summon another fairy monster from the graveyard. Although not outright shouting as a reference, Superbia's inspiration is the deadly sin of pride, as Superbia in Latin means pride. Although there are a couple more Dark Lord monsters in the archetype, they mainly refer to Mayan theology, which we'll save for another episode. But on the topic of deities and gods, let's talk about the ones in Yu-Gi-Oh! So everyone knows the god cards like Slifer the Sky Dragon, Obelisk the Tormentor, and the Winged Dragon of Ra. They are part of the pretty exclusive attribute called Divine, and an equally exclusive type called Divine Beast. Now, although officially they are the only ones, except for one case, there are actually a couple of other monsters that are considered Divine Beast or Divine Monsters that aren't exactly Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG or OCG specific. But let's talk about the fourth card in the god trio, Halakti, the creator of light. This level 12 divine monster has question mark stats and is the only card in its type, which is the creator god type monster. So arguably more powerful than the god cards themselves. Its effect is a summon condition and is essentially a game winner card. It can only be special summoning by tributing all three god cards and your opponent can't negate the summon. 
Once summoned, you simply win the duel. Now, in terms of specifically Divine Beast monsters, there are a couple more exceptions according to the Yu-Gi-Oh! R comic as well as the 5D anime. There's the Sacred Beast, also known as the Three Phantasms, Ura, Lord of Searing Flames, Hamon, Lord of Striking Thunder, and Raviel, Lord of Phantasms, who, all according to the Yu-Gi-Oh! R comic, are Divine Beast-type monsters. But in the TCG and OCG, they are Thunder, Pyro, and Fiend. Even their fused form, Armor Tile the Chaos Phantasm, is just a Fiend-type monster. There are also the Wicked Gods that share the same source for their credibility of being Divine Beasts. The Wicked Avatar, the Wicked Dreadroot, and the Wicked Eraser are all Divine Beast types according to the manga, as they are dark counterparts to the original God cards, a bleak weaker as they're only level 10 rather than the gods level 12. Following Yu-Gi-Oh! GX, there's also Divine Beast monsters from the 5Ds era. The Azure God Synchro monsters are also considered Divine Beasts as well as a Divine type according to the 5Ds anime. Loki, Lord of the Azure, was changed to a Dark Spellcaster. Thord, Lord of the Azure, was changed to an Earth Beast Warrior, and Odin, Father of the Azure, was changed to Light Fairy. It's pretty unfortunate that this group is so exclusive. As a whole, the God cards are pretty unique, so it's both good and bad that these cards are in such a niche group. However, there are cards that can easily overpower the so-called strongest cards in the game in one way or another, just like the next cards on our list. Get all the jokes out now everyone, as next up we have number 69, Heldred Crest. This rank 4 Xyz monster needs any 3 level 4 monsters for its summon. This light psychic monster has 2600 attack and comes with a pretty unique effect. Once summoned, Heldred Crest negates the effects of all other Xyz monsters in the field. Then you can target another Xyz monster in the field and Heldred Crest will copy its name and original effect until the end phase. On top of that, it doesn't even need to detach materials, so you're free to use the copied effect of another Xyz monster. However, despite the unique effect of Heldry Crest, that's not entirely why it's on today's episode of The Unknown Sign. See, in the Zexal anime, Heldry Crest had a significantly more powered up effect. In the anime, Vetrix wielded the Heldry Crest. Long story short, Vetrix was the secondary big bad of the World Duel Carnival arc, and him, alongside his three sons, Trey, Quattro, and Quinto, targeted Yuma to capture Utopia. And yes, you heard me right, Vetrix has three sons. Despite looking like and being the size of a child, he was tricked into opening a door to another dimension which matured Vetrix into his miniature-sized man. In the anime, Heldry Crest had a bit stronger of an effect. Rather than being just an anti xyz card, it's more of an anti-card in general. In the anime, Crest's effect was that the effects of all other face-up monsters are negated, while at the same time, Heraldry Crest would gain those effects. Yes, effects plural. So that means Heraldry Crest could have multiple effects at the same time. On top of that, not only does Heraldry Crest have card effect destruction immunity, in the anime, number cards, so cards that have number before them, like number 69 Heraldry Crest, can only be destroyed by other number monsters. So Heraldry Crest had some pretty amazing survivability. The last effect of Heraldry Crest, and what it can use its materials for, is that when your opponent's monster declares an attack, you can detach a material to target and destroy one card your opponent controls. So suffice to say, the enemy Heraldry Crest is arguably one of the stronger floodgates in the game. But that's not where it ends. Heraldry Crest, like other Xyz monsters, can evolve into its C form. Number C69 Heraldry Crest of Horror, sitting as a rank 5 with the same attribute and type as its previous form, C69 is quite a bit stronger, with a staggering 4000 attack and 1600 defense. However, with such an impressive stat line, C69 requires a lot of materials, specifically 4 level 5 monsters. The payoff is its multiple effects. The first is that when an opponent's monster declares an attack, you can destroy all cards your opponent controls. Then, if its previous form, number 69 Heldry Crest, is attached as a material, it gains its detaching material effect. Which is that, once per turn, you can detach a material to target one face-up Xyz monster your opponent controls, then C69 gains attack equal to that face-up monster's original attack, and C69 copies that monster's name and effects until the end phase. This version of Heraldry Crest has a couple of records under its name. It's the highest attack of any psychic monster as well as the highest attack of any rank 5. The closest competitors are Dig Vorzak, King of Heavy Industry with 3200 attack for rank 5s, and Hyper Psychic Blaster slash Assault Mode at 3500 attack for Psychic. The impressive attack point value C69 is the combination of the previous attack and defense of the original 69 with 2600 attack and 1400 defense. On top of that, C69 was a pioneer of a couple of things. It was the first number C Psychic Monster, as well as the first card to be summoned by Chaos Field. This was an anime-exclusive field spell that had one special effect. Once per turn, you can detach material from a C number card you control to special summon a random number card from your opponent's extra deck, with the cost of not being able to attack, having its effects negated, and being destroyed during the end phase, unless you activated the secondary effect of Chaos Field. The second effect was that you would target an Xyz monster that was special summoned from your opponent's extra deck by the first effect, then Xyz summon from your extra deck one CXYZ monster 
That's one rank higher than a monster by using it as a material. Unlike the original Heritage Crest, C69's anime counterpart isn't as unfair to play against. The anime version has a slightly stronger effect, but not too different. It has the standard battle immunity for number monsters, as well as its copying effect lasts until your next standby phase, rather than just the end phase. And for good measure, it has the original Heritage Crest effect that when an opponent's monster declares an attack, you can destroy all cards your opponent controls. Ending today's episode is a level 6 ritual monster, Revendred Slayer. Requiring any Vendred ritual spell to summon, Slayer is the quote-unquote main character of the Vendred archetype. Its effect allows it to, during damage calculation, banish a zombie monster from the graveyard to boost its attack by 300 points, bringing it to 2700, which isn't too bad for a level 6 monster. On top of that, if the ritual summoned Slayer is sent to the graveyard, you can search for any ritual spell from your deck and foolish a Vendred monster, meaning you send it from your deck to the graveyard. Although this seems underwhelming, Revenge Red Slayer works extremely well than its archetype. See, the Vendred archetype, or at least the non-ritual monsters, have the two typical effects. The first typically revolves around special summoning the monster from the graveyard, and the other is that if the monster is used for a ritual summon of a Vendred ritual monster, it gains an additional effect. So, for example, Vendred Core is a level 1 dark zombie monster with 0 attack and 500 defense. Its effects are that 1. If it's in the graveyard, you can banish another zombie monster to special summon Vendred Core from your graveyard, but banish it when it leaves the field. The other effect is that if Core is used in a ritual summon of a Vendred monster, it gives the ritual monster the effects of being unable to be targeted by your opponent's card effects. Despite the unique mechanic of the Vendred monsters, why they are on today's episode of the Unknown Side is due to their story and their inspirations. The Vendred monsters are a combination of a couple of different horror series like Resident Evil and The Thing, as well as their short lore related story. And fun fact, the archetype was one of the two TCG exclusive archetypes introduced to the game, with the other being the FA monsters. There are six non-ritual Vendred monsters that are all somewhat different in their effects but accomplish the same goals, but they are also all inspiration from other series. There's the aforementioned Vendred Core, which is based off of Resident Evil's Ouroboros virus, and the Necroplasm virus. There's Vendred Stridges, which is based off of the Crows from Resident Evil, and it can special summon itself by revealing a Vendred card, as well as it provides after battle calculation of your ritual monster to draw and discard a card. There's Hound Horde, which is based off of the Thing's Kennel Thing, which are essentially zombie dogs. Hound Horde can special summon itself by discarding a Vendred card, and it allows your ritual monster to quick effect banish a spell and trap that your opponent controls. Then there's Vendred Revenants, which are your typical zombies which can special summon itself when destroyed by an opponent's card, and lets your ritual monster banish a special summon monster of your opponent's. Last is the Scar the Vendred, which is somewhat unique. Scar the Vendred doubles down on the graveyard support rather than being a ritual material. See, Scar's effect, once it's sent to the graveyard, you can search a Vendred spell or trap and add it to your hand. Then, if a monster is distributed, you can banish another zombie monster to special summon Scar. So essentially you get a search and a 2300 attack beat stick, which isn't too bad. So let's briefly touch on the lore. In the City of Heroes, a zombie apocalypse broke out. Likely an experiment gone wrong, the Vendred core was exposed to the population and things took a turn for the worse. However, rather than saving the city, it was decided the area would be quarantined. It was decided there would be no evacuation, that nobody within the quarantine area could be saved, and so the few survivors were locked in with no chance of escape. A family man was locked inside. He had already lost his wife, his everything in the initial wave of zombies. Sheer rage came over him when he was infected, and rather than becoming another mindless zombie, he became the Revenge Red Slayer. Slayer spends his nights taking vengeance on those who took everything from him, eradicating the zombies that plagued his home. As his fight continues, he approaches a giant mass of flesh. Could this be the source of the zombies? If I kill this thing, would I save my city? Slayer thought to himself. Either way, he was taking this giant flesh heap down. Vendred Slayer charged the amalgamation of zombie fight creatures. Cutting deep into its body with various slashes, it only seemed to anger the monster. Vendred Chimera was deeply angered, but it wasn't attacking back. Vendred Chimera started shifting around, curling into a defensive position, and then burrowed away. Slayer followed suit, but he was surprised at how fast the Chimera dug. Reaching over a mountain of debris, Slayer arrived, and it was a trap. Standing in front of him was what could only be described as the leader of the zombies, the source, Vendred Battle Lord. But Slayer wasn't intimidated one bit. In fact, he was more cheerful at the opportunity to go all out and enacted vengeance on the horde of zombies. Vendred Slayer charged in, attacking and tearing through the hordes of zombies. It didn't matter their numbers. It didn't matter their strength. All that mattered was that Slayer would live up to his name and slay. He leapt at Battle Lord with no hesitation, ripped out his heart in mere moments. It all happened so fast, not even the zombie that survived understood what happened. As the source of the pandemic fell to the ground and started to decay, Vendred Slayer started to assimilate the infected heart of Battle Lord gaining new powers, becoming Revenge Red Executor. With the day saved, Slayer, or the now Executor, can be at peace and rest with his wife in the afterlife. 
Although the story of Vendred monsters is pretty short, it's nice in comparison to other larger archetypes like Albaz or Visa Starfrost. Some nice, smaller, self-contained stories to balance out the longer ones. And that's it for today's episode. If you have any suggestions on cards you'd like to see in this series, let us know in the comments down below.